All right, we are looking at, according to my YouTube channel page, this is the ninth of these bad boys where I just rant for however long it takes me to rant about, sorry, Avast is trying to sell me stuff. I just rant. This is a reshoot because I screwed something up on Filmora, but I think I figured it out and we are go. This, this first monstrosity is 13 indigo children traits and signs of a new age revolutionary. Note our cover photo of four white hippies. In, it looks like, two hetero relationships. Are they, are they a band? I don't, I don't know. What is an indigo child? Okay, so some background on this website, because like, in the like, about section, don't do that. That's forbidden. There's no new tabs. I hate this so much. So in the about section, it turns out that this is the official website for Gaia TV and not the Gaia of the cute dress up avatars of my childhood, which was bone crushingly disappointing to learn, but not at all surprising given that this is our content. This is what we can expect. The illusion of self. That's about what we're in for. So, what is an indigo child? This was big in the New Tens. I remember being, like, in school and Googling, like, signs you're an indigo child and, like, the number one was, like, you have a feeling of deserving to be here. Which was always a bad thing in my house. That was always dangerous in my house growing up. Um, because my parents are crazy. It's not slander if it's true. An indigo child or indigo kid is an upgraded blueprint of humanity, a term that came up when addressing the aura colors of these very different kids. Previously, auric fields were expected shades of the rainbow, but the indigo's field was dominated by a royal blue color, thus establishing a change of course in human evolution. <sighs> the grammar in this article, I, I went through it for the first shoot, which was an audio disaster. The grammar's dog shit. The science, dog shit. But of course, this is Gaia TV. They don't care about science. I went on this tear about how it bugs me, how evolution is portrayed as always having a goal outside of what works for the environment right now. And really all evolution is, is change over time. So it really bothers me as someone who has a degree in molecular biology who understands the science better than the average Joe. I, I just realized how abysmal everyone in the country is at understanding science. Because this is the state of things. <clears throat> so, I went on this rant about evolution not really having a goal and how it bothers me when it's portrayed that way. Um... This, by the way, is the reason I hate the Predator, the 2018 Predator movie with, like, the 11-foot-tall Ultras mega uber Predator. Um, and the idea was that autism was the next phase in human evolution. And I'm not autistic. I don't know if I know any autistic people. But that does not at all check out. That does not check out. And we're going to talk about... Um, we're going to talk about consciousness and dissociative identity disorder. That's the next article on the list. But <sighs> G 
gifted children on a clear mission to challenge and shift reality, they first began appearing in the 1970s. Beyond psychic awareness, they are highly driven and creative with a perception that sees through the established norms of society. Old souls, indeed, their mission is clearly laid out to shake up the modern world and pave the way for future generations to create greater peace and harmony for all. Both of these generations are children are well into their teens and adulthood, so don't allow the label to dissuade you from exploring the concept of indigo children. All right, the meat of the article. 13 common traits of indigo children. Let's go! <laughs> I had to do that again. <laughs> you feel spiritually awakened. You were born to be a light worker and have felt from a young age that you're trapped, tapped into something spiritually greater than most people are. Okay, quick question. Has anyone ever been able to tell me what the fuck a light worker is? Has anyone ever been able to effectively define this term? Because seriously, what the fuck? This whole article is a lot of Bardem phrases, which is basically making sounds that sound all deep and mystical, but really it could apply to just about anyone with a little bit of thought. For example, you are destined to be here. Because that's how being born on Earth to live through 2020 works. You are confident and even arrogant at times and emboldened by something larger than you can name. The first, there's usually like a standard 10 point list of how to know if you're an indigo children. The first one was, um, feeling like you're deserving to be here or like you, you're royalty or something like that. That ties into this. You are confident and even arrogant at times. Those go together. You know that you were put on this planet for a reason and that reason is to enact positive change. You know that those who are native to this planet are growing and ascending and need help in their transformation. So are we are we now linking indigo children to star children? If you saw the Dr. Boylan episode, He Have Many Letters, um, you'll know a thing or two about star children, and it's kind of the same, like, Barnum phrasey kind of thing. That's That's kind of where we're at. You have high expectations of yourself and others. Me, IRL. Um, you have a strong intuition. Indigos see the world differently coupled with innate self-assurance. You think that your way is right and are offended that if others cannot see much, let's take action from your point of view. If indigos rule the world, you are confident no problems would exist. I, for one, am not that confident. You question authority. Everyone should question authority. Always question authority. Related to that, you want to overturn the man. Eat the rich! You are creative. You are a change maker. You're, you're so aware of the failings of society, which in turn makes you a magnificent leader. Those two don't necessarily mean the same thing. Is being aware of the failings of society a leadership skill, or is being able to communicate that a leadership skill? You are a lost soul. You feel out of place with others as you recognize you are different than most people. That's how people work. No one fits in 100%. You are headstrong. 
As the indigo soul mission is encoded into your very being, you know your self-worth, you are unwilling to back down from confronting what feels out of integrity. This is very strange phrasing. Additionally, this point links into what I mentioned earlier, um, feeling like you're deserving to be here, things like that. You are passionate and focused. While fiery temperance may be hard to take, you are not one to be still or silenced. I... You have psychic abilities. Without any need for development, your psychic capacity, clairvoyance, empathy, telepathy, is finely tuned. While you see nothing special in your ability, it gives you an advantage in reading others with ease and seeing through masks. Not in 2020, it don't. This one reminded me, um, I found this website when I was a kid, and I don't think it's still operable, but... It was a, like, develop your psychic powers kind of um, test website, and you, you go on there and, like, practice. And there was a screen of, like, you focus on, like, different little things. There was a bar with a, a slider, and you would try to push it one way or the other with your mind. Um, I could never see if I had, if I developed any progress, because, like, I had to, fo I could focus, like, only with my eyes closed. So, I was I was never really sure what came of that, but it kind of seems, looking back, like it was all, like, randomly, random algorithms. Really. Primarily. And finally, you are frustrated. Coupled with their big f picture vision and restless soul drive for change, you become easily frustrated with society and others who are not shifting quickly enough. Patience is something that should be developed. Okay. This sentence is not the best constructed. It's it's really not. The grammar here is all over the place. They are just saying words. They are just making sounds. None of this makes any goddamn sense. Consciousness might be explained by multiple personality disorder with a um, attempt at a galaxy brain, I think. This was complicated for me to read because I'm not familiar with philosophy. I'm not familiar with dissociative identity disorder. I don't even know which is the um, correct medical term for that actually anymore. Let's check. Previously called multiple personality disorder. Okay, so dissociative identity disorder is the current phrase. The idea that our sentience... Okay, I remember in the last filming that was, again, a disaster. Sentience was not the choice of word I would use. Um... Sentience is like a sense that you have a self. Lots of animals um, have this. Dogs, uh, monkeys of various kinds, all kinds probably. Elephants probably. You know, all kinds of animals. Maybe plants, but we're not 100% sure. The um, sapience is... Uh, Let's just look this up again. A sapient being is one that humans would recognize as intelligent, if not necessarily as intelligent as humans. On Earth, other examples include gorillas and probably dolphins. 
A Sophon is a being that is at least as smart as a human. That's probably where you want to look for, like, intelligent alien life. And that's the word I like to use for that for that kind of thing. Just because it sounds cool and no one else seems to be using it. The idea that Arsenians may be the product of a conscious universe experiencing itself is not a new one. In fact, it's the central philosophy behind more than one religion, i.e. Hinduism and Buddhism. A paper published by philosopher Bernaldo Castrop has laid out a convincing argument to reconcile his, this idealistic theory with dissociative identity disorder, otherwise known as multiple personality disorder. Those suffering from DID exhibit at least two disparate personalities experiencing reality through distinctly desperate, separate lenses, despite inhabiting the same physical body. These personas, known as alters, can sometimes be completely unaware of each other's being, compartmentalizing their lives and essentially leading parallel existences. Scientists discovered that DID sufferers' various alters can affect attributes of the body to the point that brain functions will literally change when a new personality takes over. This, by the way, links to a study on PLOS1, Dissociative Part Dependent Resting State Activity in Dissociative Identity Disorder, a Controlled FMIR, FMRI Perfusion Study. Whole study's on here. Um, doesn't look at all like it's behind a paywall. So, uh, points. Mad points. EEG tests showed that the region of the brain associated with vision actually shut down when a blind alter took over a patient's body. When the sighted alter took over, that region of the brain resumed normal function. It is undoubtedly difficult to lead a normal life if you suffer from DID, but it's possible for this level of dissociation in which multiple personalities with their own sense of individual self can occupy a single psyche, then what's to say, okay, we are going, I didn't notice this the first time, but we are going from it is undoubtedly difficult to lead a normal life to what's to say that an analogous mechanism isn't at work in the relationship between our individual consciousness and a greater universal consciousness. And that's quite a fucking leap. You had us in the first half, not gonna lie. This, by the way, links to a Gaia article. Castro likes to call this universal consciousness mind at large. This links to a YouTube video, and I don't fucking give a shit. And he describes our relationship with it like the essence of a tree. Our individual psyches branch off in their own directions, but at their roots beneath the soil, they grow out of a greater individual organism. And the reason we're unable to see that a connection is due to that layer of soil, or what Castro refers to as the obfuscation of our collective consciousness. Maybe a better example of this can be seen through the individual neuron in the brain, a microscopic cell that receives, processes, and transmits information through electrical and chemical signals. There are billions of individual neurons throughout the brain connected through dendrites and axon fibers which pick up small bits of data to transfer and inform the greater organ as a whole. Our individual con consciousness is much like an individual neuron in the brain receiving, processing, and transmitting data between other neurons within synapses and neural circuits informing the greater whole we call society and humanity. This comparison is even more intriguing when you compare the images of a simulated map of the known universe with the brain cells of a living being. The similarities are uncanny. I had to double check this one. And my search for a map of the universe led me to discover this map of Lania Kea, our local supercluster here. We, by the way, are apparently here. And... This is just, like, the neighborhood, more or less. This is not necessarily, like, the whole known universe. And sure, this looks similar to, uh, to this. 
sort of, but they aren't exactly the same thing. And actually the description underneath here says, an internal, an international group of astrophysicists used a computer simulation last year to recreate how the universe grew and evolved. The simulation image above is a snapshot of the present universe that features a large cluster of galaxies, bright yellow, surrounded by thousands of stars, galaxies, and dark matter web. That's not the same as this. Um, by the way, this is super cool, and I'm totally saving this to look into for later. Just, just so you know. Um... I'm writing a book, this might be very useful for that. But those aren't necessarily exactly the same. Castrop is a strong opponent of the materialist view that our mind is a product of the brain. This view says that the physical world or matter is a fundamental substance of nature and that it dictates reality. It says our mind and subsequently our consciousness can be reduced to the product of predictable Physical interactions in the brain explained through metrics such as mass, momentum, charge, and spin. And here's the part where I brought up love in the last attempt at this. Love can be, at least at the start, a series of chemical interactions in the brain. But ultimately, like, if you're talking about couples that are together for 50 years, they're best friends, they enjoy each other's company... They ultimately chose to stay together that long. Because love is more complicated than that. Funny how that works. But materialism has an irresoluble issue known as the hard problem of consciousness. These, me these metrics are used to define matter can be applied to our subjective experience of reality. Try explaining the color red or the happiest you've ever felt. Qualia prevent our consciousness from being defined by these standards. And I had to look up qualia. I think it's um, individual experiences. Like the time, the time I saw a UFO would be an example of this. And then there's the other time I saw it I think was a military test device. That would be another individual instance, I think. And according to Castro, any attempt to solve the hard problem of consciousness by viewing consciousness as the product of our reality is futile. Conversely, viewing reality as the product of our consciousness makes the hard problem of consciousness a moot point. Here's the part where they lose the plot in my book, because I can't tell what they're going for. You can't prove that the reality exists without consciousness, and if we continue to argue this point, we find ourselves trapped in circular reasoning. So I'm not sure what they're trying to say, which is apparently par for the course for these Gaia articles. Um, Castrop has a website, and we'll get to that in a hot second, but... The, this this is a very short article, and I feel as though I have learned nothing. I feel almost like I've learned negative things, even on my second pass through it. There's no consciousness in our brain-body system. Our brain-body system is in consciousness. Our brain is a second-person perspective of a first-person experience. These are Kastrup's intrinsic tenets. I'm fucking lost. I've learned negative things. I've lost brain cells. When we look back at the cosmos, or our reality, we're observing the universe as mental processes outside of our own individual altar. Our lives are the dissociative process of the universe's consciousness, and everything we see is simply another dissociative process in the, at large. Has Kastrup's monistic idealism solved the hard problem con <clears throat> of consciousness, or simply sidestepped it? I don't know. Okay. This is Kastrup's website, Metaphysical Speculations. He's big banner ad revealing the idealist philosophy underlying the work of the world's greatest psychologist, Decoding Jung's Metaphors by Bernardo Kastrup. Bernardo Kastrup is the executive director of Essentia Foundation. We're going to get there. 
His hard work has been leading the modern renaissance of metaphysical idealism, the notion that reality is essentially mental. He has a PhD in philosophy, ontology, philosophy of mind, and another PhD in computer energy engineering, reconfigurable computing, artificial intelligence. As a scientist, Bernardo has worked for the European Organization for Nuclear Research, CERN, and the Phillips Research Laboratories where the Casimir effect of quantum field theory was discovered. Formula detail in many academic papers and books, his ideas have been featured on Scientific American, the Institute of Art and Ideas, the blog of the American Philosophical Association, and Big Think, among others. You might complete profile. We are not going to do that. Here is the Essentia Foundation in just a bit. They have a coat of arms. Rethinking Identity, Children's Experiences of Self. Dr. Thomas argues that children before a conceptual, culture-bound notion of self is inculcated in them have a more spontaneous, broader sense of identity that defies our current worldview. She argues that more natural, their more natural, fluid self is more conducive to overcoming the despair characteristic of our present situation and that it has much to teach us about reality itself. And I don't give a shit. The About Us page. The challenge. The very first thing that we get to see. We live under a materialist metaphysics. All that supposedly exists is matter, an abstract identity entity conceptually defined as being outside and independent of consciousness. Not necessarily true. Matter is typically defined as that which has mass. This could be a book a subatomic particle, a black hole, a sun, galaxies, things like that. Um, I don't know enough about consciousness to say whether the two are supposed to be mutually exclusive, but that's... This metaphysics is often conflated with science itself, although even the scientists even though the scientific method only allows us to determine how nature behaves, not what nature is in and of itself. The mainstream cultural endorsement of metaphysical materialism became firmly established in the second half of the 19th century. Since then, however, its strength has been derived mainly from intellectual habit inherited assumptions, not from clear reasoning, evidence, or explanatory power. This is the part where I feel like I feel like this is kin, in a sense, to, to a, this is the same mindset that leads to ancient astronaut theory, because you're like, oh, well, mainstream science is just about intellectual habit and inherited assumptions, and I am going to break the mold by explaining how the Nephilim were real, actually. It's... Now I'm all for, like, examining evidence and things like that, but the when the evidence is weak, just, it's a waste of my time. Over the past few decades, evidence has been accumulating in foundations of physics, neuroscience, and analytic philosophy that materialism is false. So, we turn again to Google. Analytic philosophy, also called linguistic philosophy, a loosely related set of approaches to philosophical problems dominant in Anglo-American philosophy from the early 20th century that emphasizes the study of language and the logical analysis of concepts. How is that in any way related to physics and neuroscience? What is happening? What is happening? Nonetheless, the cultural prevalence of metaphysical materialism has myriad and arguably dysfunctional implications at both individual and social levels. It impacts our sense of meaning and purpose, our value systems, our understanding of health, disease, and death, as well as the way we relate to others, the planet, and even ourselves. Okay. 
I am well into the deep end. Clearly. Essentia Foundation aims at communicating in an accurate yet accessible way the latest analytic and scientific indications that metaphysical materialism is fundamentally flawed. Indeed, clear reasoning and the evidence at hand indicate that metaphysical idealism or non-dualism, the notion that nature is essentially mental, is the best explanatory model we currently have. Explanatory for what?! This is known in specialist communities, but hasn't yet been openly communicated in an accessible manner to the culture at large. Specialist communities. You mean like... Cranks? <laughs> Editorial commitment. Essentia Foundation is not philosophically neutral. We were created precisely to address an imbalance in how the metaphysical implications of results from science and philosophy are communicated by the media. I have to give points for addressing, for like, pointing out your bias. You can expect from us editorial rigor, accuracy, and careful selection of the material we choose to publish. We only publish creditable work. Credible work. Essentia Foundation shall never promote nonsense, pseudoscience, or gullible, unsubstantiated claims of the kind often associated with mind-first ontologies in the popular culture. Strangely, I am not reassured, but thank you for trying. Here's our team. Founder and Chairman Fred Matzer, who looks like he's on a boat, Evert Group, non-executive director. Professor Dr. Jan van der Grief, non-executive director. And our man, our man, Bernardo Castrup, executive, Cat, Castrup, executive director. Academic advisory board. Lots of people I don't actually recognize. And this guy who looks like David Wilcock. And you can contribute if you want. So, uh, somehow that was slightly easier on the second run, but only because I speed ran a bit. Just, uh, it still killed my brain cells.